Hello everyone. Today I am going to discuss about the Indian economic development at the eve of independence. My dear friend, what is development and why we need to measure the developmental aspect? Actually, if you want to know the reason behind the global recession, the inflation, the meltdown or the, <clears throat> the happiness index or purchasing power parity or whatever like macroeconomic indicators you must know the parameters of economic development. But then when talking about Indian economy as we all know that it was placed under the colonial regime for more than 200 years and generally the colonial writer claimed that whatever modern in India comes from the colonial regime. We need to verify their claims. We need to know that what was the actual status of Indian economy prior to the coming of the British regime. My dear friend, prior to the British regime, it cannot be denied that India was largely an agrarian economy, but then even Europe was not the industrialized economy. It is true that industrialization reached in Europe more than 200 years ahead of us, but then India was a prized position for Britain and their Indian <coughs> position was one of the factor behind the industrial revolution in England. Now the question comes in place, what was the economy here? Yeah, we used to export, you will be astonished to know, in 17th century when Bernier visited India, basically he visited Bengal, he claims that Bengal is prosperous than Egypt and Dhaka Malmal, Dhaka Maslin was a world famous product. We used to export the textile, the sugar, used to product, you know, the butter, right, dates, so many items to the world, yeah. And, uh, 17th century India was one of the dominating exporting company, you know, you can say ex exporting a state, especially from the western coast, right, we used to export a lot. and. Uh, our agriculture were self-dependent, they were not dependent on any foreign economy or so. What happened when the Britishers came to India? Actually, Britishers, the East India Company was formed for the purpose of overseas trade 
and it came to India with the very purpose of trade only. But in due course of time, as anarchy was prevailing in Indian states, Mughals became very weak. There were constant, you know, clashes among the regional forces. Britishers took it as the advantage to exploit their economy or economic position. And then they started interfering into our political matters to leverage their economic position. That is why it cannot be a coincidence that in 1757, Battle of Palasi, they conquered Bengal and thereafter East India Company became the richest company in the world. So, this kind of foresightedness was not there among their other European rivals and that is why Britishers succeeded in exploiting India in a far better way for their own sake. Now the question comes in place. how they started exploiting this country. Actually, as you know that the Mughals were the central authority prior to the Britishers. So, gradually they started passing on, passing on the Diwani rights, that means the collection of tax to the Britishers. And this Diwani right basically was the main source of exploitation by the Britishers in India. Lord Cornwallis brought one draconian system known as Jamindari system, also called as the permanent settlement system around 1793. And likewise, there were three systems of Diwani rights by the Britishers. One was the Jamindari system prevailed generally the eastern part of India. Then one was Rayatwari system which prevailed in their southern area and then there was one Mahalwari system which prevailed in central and India and Punjab kind of places. So now the question comes in place whether these three, three systems were the new systems? No. By name or nomenclature, it existed since centuries. So, nomenclature was it was not a new system. But then why a huge lot of, you know, hue and cry against the system of permanent settlement, Rayatwari and Mahalwari, it comes naturally in our mind. Why? When the name was the same, <laughs> but the nature was not the same. It was totally a different kind of system, my dear friends. And it was the system of exploitation. I tell you some classic uh, differences. Like earlier, it was the system that uh, the Jamindari was a kind of, you know, feudal system. And it used to pass on from one family, uh, you know, family uh, uh, to his elder son. And then uh, for generation and generation, uh, it was reserved for certain families known as the Jamindars, right? So, they used to collect the land taxes and they used to deposit <coughs> uh, the entire taxes to the Mughals or whatever authority in the center. Against that, they used to get 2.5 to 10 percent of the lagan. Sometimes if natural calamity broke out or something bad happened, even the Mughals used to wave off the lagan for 4 or 5 years or so. They were very liberal rulers. And uh, Jamindar sometimes, uh, suppose there is a battle of succession going on among the Mughals, they won't use to deposit the Lagans also, right? Because center was facing <clears throat> kind of anarchy for a long. So, but all of a sudden when the Britishers came, they were quite organized people. And they didn't want anything, you know, they were quite mechanical kind of people. 
they were least bothered about the consequences and that is why they succeeded in making the industrial revolution at their place because they, they wanted a, a constant supply of uh, <coughs> the raw material and the money and income for the Britishers. So, so that is why they introduced the permanent settlement and what way it was different. Now the post of Jamindari was open to anyone, it, was, it became a legal tender kind of thing. So, those, those who bid highest price, they will get the tender of Chamindari. That means, suppose uh, a place called Bengal, right? Earlier it used to come 20 lakhs lagan. You are a Jamindar, you are giving the tender of 50 lakhs. Okay, now you are the Jamindar, come what may or whatever may be your caste. So, in that way they broke the caste system, traditional caste system, traditional Jamindars, right? Secondly, what they did, <clears throat> these lagans were fixed for next 20, 30 years, right? Come what may, maybe any natural calamity or famine or whatever uh, breaks out. So, there is a sunset law. You have to deposit your lagan by the time uh, of a certain date before the sunset, right? So, you cannot uh, betray that. So, in that way, they were bind to uh, pay the lagan before time, right. So, in that, uh, and they had the liberty to use their private army, right, which was not a case during the Mughals. Mughals uh, used to, uh, to employ their own, you know, people and they had a central army kind of thing. But now, Jamindars got the police power, basically. Suppose a Jamindar uh, willing to misuse his power, right. So, he may ask for uh, more lagan, he may ask for that, he may claim that certain tenants have not paid the, uh, you know, lagan. In that way, if the course, uh, case moves to the court, court will be completely favorable towards the Jamindar. So, what will happen? The farmers and peasants, they will, uh, will uh, left with no other option than to commit suicide or left for a starvation, right. That is why within 5-10 years when the battle of Palasi happened, one third of Bengal died of starvation. So, that cannot be a coincidence also. And that was a man-made kind of, you know, a starvation, which never used to take place before. So, in that way, Britishers used to exploit and they were very much rule bound people. They did not bother if you say that sir 500 people died, they will say okay let 1000 <laughs> another die, right. They are not bothered about very contemptuous kind of people. They were least bothered about you know, uh, least human because they were not ruling from India, they were ruling from London. So, if uh, Mughals at least were <laughs> Uh, staying in Agra or, uh, or Malaysia, Delhi. So, if you are not happy with the Mughals, you may attack to them, but you can't do the same with the Britishers, right. So, you are completely helpless against the Britishers. Si similar system was placed in Jamindari and Rayatwari system, just the utilitarian point of view, because uh, they thought Jamindars are getting 9 percent of the commission. If we can make it without commission, then official establishment will cost us 2 to 3 percent. So, that is why this Rayatwari system came and then Mahalwari system, right. So, almost similar features were there, much uh, uh, no much difference. This was one way of exploiting India. What was another way and what was the another way they used to exploit India, right. Another way was that they used to, you know, when our farmers, you know, became indebted, they were left with no option. They were, they were, suppose if uh, the season has come for cropping, cropping season has come, Kharif, Rabi, how they are going to plant? So, they were left with no money. They were indebted. So, now some British capitalists will come and they will give advance money, but for what? they will give the advance money for their own sake and they will uh, force them 
to raise only those crops what they want and the crops which are in global demand like indigo tea right like whatever you know commercial crops you can say so now they were not doing the commercial crops because they were willing to do it it was because they were compelled to do so they have, they were left with no other option right so that is known as commercialization of agriculture in india here india was producing for the global community and against that they they didn't had uh, uh, the sufficient production for their self survival so it was a kind of ridiculous system right which was killing our, our farmers secondly when the industrial revolution came in <clears throat> britain uh, it used to exploit india in two ways first they, they made india as the hub of raw material supply right secondly they used to sell the ready made material uh, which came out of the industrial revolution machine made products to the indian market so india was uh, at one point of time a supplier for their raw material as well as a big market for their own products and prior to the industrial revolution as you know that india was largely dependent to the handicrafts we were very much skillful in handicraft industry but then everybody knows that handicraft you know uh, if tiger is there and uh, rat is there <laughs> rat cannot kill the tiger right so handicrafts were not competent in uh, against these industrialized products suppose if, if khadi consumes 3 days to uh, make one shirt they will make lakhs of shirt in one day so definitely khadi cannot compete with uh, the power looms right there are so many things like suppose you are using terracotta cups so you are using and throwing it but when a steel cups are coming everybody will prefer for the steel so in that way entire handicraft industry was swallowed by the industrial products which were coming from especially from britain another thing was that they always you know used favorable kind of tariff to promote their product suppose something in coming from london to india they will have to pay very less tariff if any product going to london from india and especially it is by the, by, produced by the indians then they will have to uh, face a very high tariff rate so in that way they completely molded our economic system our economic structure in favor of their own colonial interest their own imperial interest and this is how now they can claim that yes we brought radio, uh, railway it was not known to you but why you brought railway you brought railway not for nationalism you brought railway for exploiting our resources why you brought postal services why you brought Uh, you you brought postal services for keeping surveillance of the indians you brought telegraph for keeping surveillance on the indians right but anyway it came and it became one of the tool uh, one of the few tools uh, to exploit our national uh, sentiment of nationalism see railway was one of the most vital factor uh, which broke the barriers of regional boundaries and cultural boundaries right so this is how they exploited our economy and when we gained the independence it was quite pathetic state of our economy you will be surprised to know that uh, infant mortality rate was 318 which is now only 33 per 1000 literacy rate was just merely 16% or so you just imagine and life expectancy was only 44 year which is now 69 so in that way you can just imagine where we were at the time of independence prior to 1921 it was the you know demographic transition level 1 that means higher birth rate and higher infant, uh, you know death rate because uh, if any uh, epidemics comes we didn't had sufficient measures to 
contain those epidemics. You know, in Corona age, how difficult it is to contain the pandemics, right? So now, friends, generally, Britishers claim that they prepared the ground for the so-called modernism in this country because they brought English, they brought the structured judicial system, they brought the railways, telegraph, postal services, whatever, whatever. They, they, they brought the schooling where uh, there was no discrimination on the caste lines. They were the one who introduced the women education. They were the one who brought the, uh, you know, ban on sati and brought the uh, bill for uh, widow remarriage. So, if you look at all these aspects, it appears that they were very liberal, very kind, you know, and very gracious people. But then, if you look deeper, to f if you will be astonished to know that every policy was intended to retain the colonial structure and all the rest of the things and all the outward structure was just the I was for the people. For example, why they laid stress on English education? Because if they brought the Britishers to India, it used to be a, a, the costly affair. So why not to recruit Indian clerks at a cheaper cost? For that, they wanted desperate spread of English, right? So it was not that they wanted everyone to become, <laughs> right? They didn't want it to. Uh, make everyone a scholar. No, that was not the purpose. The intended purpose was that how to make the administration, administration a utilitarian kind of a structure. So, even uh, for civil services recruitment, as you know, that it was deliberately made in a manner that no Indians could enter. And that is why till uh, the beginning of 19th century or 20th century, you, you you won't get many Indians till 1900, only three or four Indians. Why it is so? Why very few people could crack the civil services? Because they constantly used to reduce the age of civil services, sometimes 26 to 21 to 19 like that. And see, the syllabus of the exam was totally different. That was based on the Western education system, the Western literature, the Western government, the Western history. So, for Indians, it was very difficult to <clears throat> connect with that culture. So, that is that was a deliberate system to stop the Indians anyway. Like, if they claim that, okay, they brought, you know, uh, this railways, we also know why they brought railway postal and all these are all you know for their own sake of exploitation to bring the raw material right railway was uh, not uh, to bring nationalism in india so secondly you can see that many indians uh, who are the front runners you can say hold the view that this government could not vanish so, in that event, we need to synchronize with the government. So, and they started introspecting our own system that no, no, we were very backward, we were agrarian, we were underdeveloped, that is why the Britishers came, it is their responsibility. So, why not we try to accommodate and learn the Western culture, the Western history, the Western uh, polity, the Western way of governance. Like, the, like Raja Ram Mohan Rai, he wanted to westernize our system. And, you know, many of these scholars had the view that uh, this regime is not going to vanish. So, we must uh, synchronize with the regime. We must synchronize with these people, right? So, this was their way of thinking. Then, 
some of them you know uh, started uh, you know making some uh, ridiculous kind of assessment like uh, in a different language like in those age press used to be the vital element and people started exploiting you know our uh, myths like Ramayana and Mahabharata and moral values to attack the Buddhists right why because uh, it, it used to be very difficult for them to connect with our our ethos <laughs> right but then they started you know studying these literature also and then they attacked the vernacular uh, press and all by 1878 act then <laughs> you you will find that in due course of time Britishers could understand that if we have to rule here we need to recruit some locals also in due course of time but then it was their compulsion it was not you know intention you can say anyway why some of the you know uh, politicians or scholars uh, who were uh, from Congress and other platforms, they could understand the nature of the British regime, the economic nature. It was very difficult for others to gain, especially Dada Bhai Naraji and Ramesh Chandra Datta, Rajni Palm Datta. They, they could find the pulse of the rule. How Dada Bhai Naraji in his famous book, Poverty and Un-British Rule of India, he tried to portray that the way the manner in which British regime is ruling in India is outright different from the way they rule in Britain right so why it is different so that means this is the un-British rule right so income wise hundred times gap so in that way he could well explain how the drain of wealth is happening from India as the fat salary to the British officials and how they are exploiting our people right in the name of government of India so many bad things are happening suppose say, say for example there was a post called secretary of a state he is staying in London and being paid on Indian account how ridiculous it is so so many things was <clears throat> there Probably uh, Ramesh Chandradat uh, in economic history of India could find out what is the you know income, uh, national income, per capita income of the Indians. So probably these economic scholars, William Digby, Ramesh Chandradatta, Rajni Palm Datta, this Dada Bhai Noroji who was the first South Asian to get <coughs> appointed as the British MP, right. So, they were the one somewhere they were instrumental behind the feeling of nationalism gaining ground by every passing day in India. So it is very clear that Britishers deliberately did not allow India to become the industrialized nations. Secondly, also in whole of their regime only two or three canals were dug. They were also not much interested in, you know, enhancing our agricultural, you know, structure. They were just interested in exploiting, exploiting and exploiting. Thank you very much.